Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be in Bochum uh, again, the way we can nowadays. Um, yes, I know that no one present here is afraid of bilateralism, but still I wanted to uh, put forward uh, a novel approach, I would say, to the matter that might be of interest um, to you guys and somebody else. So let me just start by uh, thanking Heinrich for having organized this issue, which was um, in, was put in print today or yesterday, finally. So it has hit the press. And uh, this volume has at least one paper which is relevant for this talk, which is the one by Sergei Drobishevich. And uh, there'll be others that will be, will be mentioned, at, if, if only briefly, during the talk. So uh, let me see uh, where I start. Where does this uh, come from? Now, I don't want to make a novel with uh, more than a thousand characters like the great uh, Chinese uh, romance of the Three Kingdoms. But there are a lot of people involved in these stories. And I, let me try to um, put these people in some uh, three different schools. Let me say it like this. M maybe you don't want to be uh, sent back to school, but, and maybe you don't want to be classified as part of this school. But let me, for the moment, uh, say that one big school of uh, approaching the problem of bilateralism is the, the one that takes the rejectivist challenge uh, uh, seriously. So uh, instead of just assuming negation to be a way of dealing with denial, they take denial as a primitive uh, concept and investigate how uh, negation can or cannot incorporate uh, denial as the opposite uh, speech act to assertion. And uh, there were quite some people who, who talked about this. I would say that some early people talking on this were uh, Bandau and Smiley, some very um, well-known papers in which they, they talk about rejectivism. And, and what I also, uh, uh, what I now baptize the Melbourne Bergen School, they never knew they were together, but by Melbourne, I mean, uh, of course, uh, Lloyd Humberson and David Ripley, at least, and uh, Bergen includes at least uh, Ulrich Jotland and uh, Ben Martin, who have written on, on the issue. Now, uh, for a second school, which I kind of um, hesitate to call the inferentialist school, because not everybody might want to be uh, labeled as an inferentialist there, so let me just call it a proof theoretic uh, approach to meaning, a PTS, Right, the proof theoretic semantics. Uh, let's. I, I would put here some early ancestors of the whole enterprise, uh, at least for what interests me here. Um, William Neal and Hugh Price and Ian Rumfit uh, and the Bochum School. Now, the Bochum School nowadays uh, includes a lot of people, even me as a former Bochumer. Uh, but I would put here at least um, some of the people who are present here, like Nils Kurbis, uh, Sarah Eichen. Um, Sergei Dorbyshevich, which was already mentioned, uh, did a little bit different because he was on Hubert style systems, more like the things I'll be presenting here. Uh, Heinrich Wanzing, who uh, worked on the matter by talking about the interplay in between two different consequence relations, which is a challenge also taken by, by Sara nowadays. Let me just uh, uh, put them on the Bochum School, which puts a uh, proof theoretic investigation as basic. But I beg to differ and I beg to disagree that bilateralism belongs to the proof theoretic approach. Uh, I think it, it might belong to more than one approach and it might, it might be approached in different ways. The third way is the one that I'm gonna um, defend more here that it's related to consequence. And uh, I think it's very, very, very clearly can be found in the work of Schuschmidt and Smiley, both on the proof theoretic uh, front or on the semantic front. Uh, because they are working on a different notion of consequence, which is the one that I'm going to take up here. So you, you can already uh, imagine and expect me to be talking about set-set uh, framework. And uh, what I call here the Lisbon Natal School, two of which are here, myself and Vito, my student, uh, Vito Greati, and uh, also in Portugal, Carlos Caleiro, Sergio Marcelino, people who have been doing a lot of work on in, in this direction. I'm going to clarify what I mean by this direction, but say that it's, it's a different approach to the, to the matter. What's the matter? Well, you know, it's the idea that assertion and denial should be taken as primitive judgments and not defined one in terms of the other, depending on specific language or some specific choices on how to understand that. that it's all a reaction to Frege, if you think of it, or Dummett, if you prefer. 
but the it's 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 an approach which has been very popular nowadays for very good reasons I would say. Well, let me introduce the, the the way I'm gonna I'm gonna present it. So uh, first of all, let's start with this uh, compatibility relation. Let me just see if I can write here. Yes, there it is. In uh, it's just a relation on set sets, so sets of formulas, sets of sentences, and uh, according to that, I'm just gonna write some logical principles in English, and then I'm going to try to translate these principles uh, using this uh, symbol. The first principle being the one that some people like to call the principle of non-contradiction, at least at the meta-theoretical level. It's not concerned with negation, it's concerned with assertion and denial. So, and that principle would say that uh, sentences should not be simultaneously asserted and denied. Now the dual to it is the principle of excluded middle in the meta-theoretical approach, in which uh, you would expect sentences to be either asserted or denied, that you wouldn't fail to, to do at least one of those, uh, to take one of those uh, speech acts, uh, or to um, attribute a sign on those acts to a, a given sentence. And finally, the third, which is not uh, always presented like this, but I, let me just try to read it like this, which is that uh, judgment configurations, when you have certain uh, organization on your judgments, you can thicken it. So thicken is the opposite of dilute, uh, as you might imagine. So the idea here is that you can, uh, uh, by dropping context, uh, make things uh, stronger. Okay, so uh, what's the idea? Well, let me try to write it in some more uh, formal terms. The idea in, 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 with respect to compatibility of these two primitive judgments would be more or less internalized like this. Uh, the first one would say that, well, if it is compatible to assert all this while you deny all that, then there must be nothing inside this intersection because you cannot put things, you cannot make things asserted and denied at the same time. The second one would say that, well, I'm taking a set of formulas here, but whenever you already uh, are willing to assert the formulas here and deny the formulas here, then you are also committed to split this set in two parts. One of these parts are going to be the asserted uh, sentences inside of it, and the, the other one, the denied sentences inside of it. Um, I'm just asking you to take this as... as, as um, not principles to be questioned, but just like rules that I'm that I'm using to axiomatize this uh, compatibility relation. And the third one uh, is what, as as I said before, if you have a number of things asserted and another number of things denied, you can just throw some of them away because, in particular, you are, you are asserting all this, and in particular, you are denying all this. Okay. Now, you might find it more familiar if I reformulate this in terms of what we call the uh, an S consequence relation or um, Shoesmith and Smiley consequence relation or generalized consequence relation. Some people even call it Scott consequence relation, but then it would be finitary. Now, how do you put it? You, all, you just take the complement. Instead of talking about the compatibility relation, you talk about the complement of it with respect to this. So... In that case, you're going to write the contrapositive versions of the earlier uh, assertions. And the contrapositive of what I wrote before is that if there is anything in common in between these two sets, then one follows from the other. Vice versa, right? Because you could, it's symmetric, so you can invert this. And uh, the other one says something which some people would identify with cut, which is that if you do a number of things uh, with respect to this, for any quasi-partition that you do of your original set, then you can cut all this and stay with just this. And the third one is what most people would call monotonicity, right? It's the contrapositive version of what I presented before. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, thickening, I'm diluting, right? I'm just adding things here and here. Now, you might not be so familiar, or might not even like this, and you might prefer the other framework, which is well known, this framework uh, set formula in which we have the T-consequence relations, or Tarskin consequence relations, which are particular cases of those, and then uh, we would express the principles using the familiar uh, forms of uh, reflexivity, um, cut, or uh, transitivity, if you prefer, and monotonicity. Okay? 
Now, uh, an important thing is that in what follows, I'll be using this symbol as a, a sequence symbol, if you prefer, because I'm just using it as syntactic sugar in the middle of uh, two sets. And I'm be talking mostly about the set set framework, mostly. And when I write something like this, I'll just call it a consecution. If you don't like that name, I like it because it's related to consequence. But if you don't like it, you can read it as sequent. OK, and um, I, I presented all this in a very abstract way. But of course, most the way that most people arrive to something like this, to a relation like uh, this one, is through uh, proof systems uh, by associating a notion of uh, inference to a certain uh, proof system or through semantical structures and associating a notion of entailment to a given uh, semantical structure the notational semantics or whatever, whichever way you want to call it. Now, uh, let me give an example before I present anything more uh, formal of how we would use this framework to describe connectives. So let's take the case two-valued connective, so something that you would expect to be able to describe in classical logic. And I'm going to show you, I wanted to write this at the moment, but I thought I would save some time if I wrote it before. So I just wrote it 15 minutes ago. So the idea is that you start with uh, a, a two-valued non-deterministic matrix for implication. That's what I call a fully indeterministic matrix because you have, say, uh, an input 0, another input 1, and the output could be anything here. So the output belongs to a certain set and could be the output could be a set for the moment. So it could be both. could be just one, just the other could be both, or could be none of them. Now, what I'm going to do with these four rules that I wrote here is to show that they describe the determinization of this truth table that corresponds to what we would expect for the matrix of classical implication. So let's take the first one. How do I read this thing over here? Well, I read it as saying that at least one of these three formulas should be Asserted. So let's take that asserted as being true for the case of classical logic. So this is saying that if you assert this and if you assert that, you cannot assert this formula. So what it is saying to us is that there is one thing that's forbidden in this truth table, which is the situation in which you put here. So again, you assert this and you assert this, so you're here and here, right? Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. You deny this and you deny this, so you cannot deny this. You have to assert at least one of them. Sorry, I said the opposite. So if you deny the first one and deny the second one, you cannot deny the third one because you have to assert at least one of them. So what this one tells you is precisely what happens in zero, 0. It tells you that here you cannot have a 0. The second one says that if you assert Q, so if you're here, and if you uh, deny P, you cannot at the same time deny P implies Q, or else you would have a counter model to this. So this is saying that here you cannot deny. So you cannot deny this. The other one is saying that if you uh, assert P and deny Q, so you're here and here, then you should not also assert this. So it's telling you that you cannot take this as an output. And the fourth one is saying that if you assert both, then you should not deny this one. So it's saying that this is forbidden. What we are left with, of course, is the matrix of classical implication, in which only this are the output options for the given inputs. Okay, of course, there's, you can have a simpler version of this. One does not describe classical negation usually in terms of these uh, three rules. So let's start again. Let's write rules that you might more easily recognize. So again, modus ponens is the first one. And what it tells, it tells us is that it tells us that you cannot, sorry, you cannot have this output. The second one says that it's the, the this introduction of the, the P as, as extra assertion. It says that if Q is the case, then Q 
implies Q cannot be cannot fail to be the case, right? Cannot be denied. And the third one says that if uh, you, you must assert at least one of those. So if you don't assert P, if you're on zero or P, then you should you cannot fail to assert the other one. So you cannot deny the other one. And again, we have the matrices for classical implication. Now, this is just one example for you to see how uh, we can use the framework, the framework of S consequence, or framework of um, the framework uh, in set set, to describe the truth table of uh, implication. And you probably can recognize these ones. And you can even recognize that this is the one that the intuitionistic logician wouldn't like. He wouldn't, in particular, do this. He would, uh, in general, allow for both uh, outputs here to be the case. It's not enough to characterize what's in, uh, intuitionistic implication, but at least this uh, we can recognize as something that the intuitionistic logician wouldn't agree with. Now, just to compare this with uh, other things that uh, have been done in the literature, as you have seen, uh, there is a sort of a procedure behind what I'm doing here. And this procedure, uh, in the short version, outputted this uh, three um, clauses, descriptive clauses, directly from the tables by looking at what you need to do to make it less indeterministic, to make it more deterministic, so to throw away the options that we had. Of course, we could have stopped before making it fully deterministic, but classical implication is fully deterministic, so we, we didn't stop before we had all this. Now, if you want to compare this to what, say, Ian Rumpfitt this, uh, did in this uh, very well-known paper, uh, you see that it's very close, uh, only that he now is using signs, plus and minus. And the first uh, thing that he wrote here as a clause to describe implication is clearly just my modal exponents here with pluses in front of the formulas. The second one is related to my second one over there, but uses a minus to do sort of a contrapositive version of this. And the third one is the one that makes uh, the most difference uh, because here you see I had two formulas on this side and he managed to manages to have just one formula on that side by putting a plus in front of this formula and pushing this one with a minus to the other side because he's committed to the set formula approach, to the Tarskian approach and he wants only to allow one formula even if it's a signed formula on the right hand side. Now, I am not committed to this, and I'm going to uh, try to convince you that you don't need either to be, connected, uh, to be committed to that by showing that to this system, you can very naturally associate uh, a proof theoretical approach, which is very nice, analytic, works pretty fine, and can be uh, uh, made fully uh, automatic, automated. But there is a very big difference happening here. As you said, if I do this, and if I can do this to any approach that uses signs, like, such as plus and minus, and rewrite it in terms of an unsigned approach, I'm kind of claiming that, um, I am claiming that the force indicators are not necessary at all. So where is bilateralism in this case? Well, I'm gonna propose that there is a way of still being bilateralist towards the end of my, of my talk by, uh, extending this notion of consequence into a, a, a two-dimensional notion of consequence, which can incorporate bilateralism in a very natural way. But let's go for the first part, part first, first things first. So I was able to describe the, 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 the truth table. You might say, well, that's just a description. It's, it's a normal form. What is it? It's just a truth table. It's not even the logic yet. The logic is more than just truth tables, for sure. Okay, so let me make some claims then that I want to uh, defend in the next minutes, and then I'm going, I'm going to return to them at the end. The first claim is that uh, indeed the procedure that I have uh, described here is very general, and every collection of truth tables even doesn't need to be a two-valued, every, every collection of truth tables may be described in this framework. I'm going to present to you a way of doing this automatically for finite valued connect collections because the description is finite in that case. But what I'm going to I'm going to do here is actually a method that works for any any many valued logic. And uh, second, as you have seen, we don't need the force indicators to do that, so they can be described using just the set set approach. And if you think that's not good enough because you want to see a proof system, I'm going to present one. I'm going to present a Hubert-style proof system on set-set. 
And that's different from what Sergei Drobyshevich did because he did a signed version of a Hubert-style system as usual in set formula. And I'm going to use an unsigned version in set set and show you how it works. Okay, you might say that having a proof system is not enough. The proof system is going to be shown to be analytic. So in a very, uh, a very specific way, you can fully automate deductions uh, in there. And actually, we have done it. Vito Gracia has actually implemented this already. In, uh, uh, and it's, it's running. You just put there a description. It extracts the, 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 the descriptive clauses and actually produces a, a proof system and a decision procedure out for it. And we have studied the complexity of this decision procedure. And in fact, uh, whenever you have a consecution, you can decide it in at most, uh, in, can decide it in ex, ex time, so exponentially, it's an ex, in the worst case scenario. And if the rules are single succeeded, so if it happens that your system, I'm going to show systems like this, which have only rules with a single succeeded, then the decision procedure is polynomial. Okay, and um, as I said, I'm going to present another approach in which actually we have some sort of bilateral rules, which are not the ones we don't need to present the things that I'm talking about here. And with those, we can do much more. And we can do things like uh, I, uh, what Heinrich Schwanzing has been doing in having two consequence relations interplaying with each other. Just that I'm going to put them together. It's just one. And I'm going to show other bonuses of this approach, in particular by showing that um, some infinite valued axiomatizations in set formula can be, can be turned into a finite, finite axiomatizations uh, if you go into this approach. So it's a, it's a great gain in terms of axiomatizability. OK, so right, let me just compare then, uh, uh, talk a little bit about the Hubert uh, calculi, then I'm going to compare it to Gensin calculi. I'm going to call this H calculi. Uh, most people will think that they know what, uh, what, this, uh, uh, what this concerns, what, what this is about. So let me just give you an example of what everybody would recognize, which is the infamous uh, derivation of P implies P which is, uh, requires a lot of ingenuity, right? You have to see that you need uh, two different instantiations of axiom one, and then that you need one instantiation, which is very non-trivial of axiom, axiom two, and then uh, you never use axiom three, but you, need, you can just combine these three things here by producing four from one and three and producing five from two and four by modus ponens. Okay, so, you might imagine, so what is a proof? What is a Hubert style proof? Well, could be either a sequence of lines, which is the first thing that I presented, could be seen as a sort of tree, which shows the structure uh, behind that sequence of lines, which is a bit nicer because then you can see what depends on what. But you can also imagine that what we do when you're doing a Hubert style proof is that you're actually defining a set. You're defining an onion. You start with your axioms. And then you apply modus ponens, you get and some theorems. You apply it again, you get all the theorems, and so on. So the set of derived formulas from a given set of premises is inductively defined very easily from uh, the given axiomatization. This is true for any proof system, in fact. But uh, in, the, in the case of Hubert-style uh, systems, this is, this is uh, pretty simple to see. But what I wanted to see is not this. I wanted to see that actually when you're writing this sequence, Forget about the structure behind it, because if you want, you can look at it. Think about the onion and think that at each moment, I'm actually adding a single thing from the next step. And then in the next, I'm going to perhaps add something from here or go to a next step. So the idea is that at every node, actually, in a Hubert style system, you have already everything you had before. You just enlarged your set of consequences. The difference that it makes is that most people get too much impressed with how you present a system and forget what the system is. And what the system is, in, th in this case, is a set of premises which is enlarged as long as we do a proof. And anything that you put inside is, is, is proved. Right? So you start with things which are taken as primitive, like the axioms, or, uh, uh, and, and then you, you prove things from them, and then you prove anything you put inside is a proof. And there will be a number of lines or a tree behind this proof. But the, po the point is that at every node, you don't have a single formula. At every node, you have all the things you had until then. 
And uh, one uh, serious problem that you have with this, if you want to study this from the proof theoretical approach, is that it, it's very nasty, has some very bad properties. For instance, if you just make a copycat connective and, and make uh, take another implication, which is a, a red implication, and rewrite all this with a red implication, put all these axioms together, it happens, it so happens that these two implications do not collapse into each other. These two implications are not the same. They're not equivalent in any way of, of, of saying that they are equivalent. So there's no uniqueness of implication uh, through this uh, approach. There's an example of, of, uh, of uh, in the case of, of implication, actually, this holds for most classical connectives, as we show in this paper, except some very few connectives like conjunction, projection, conjunction, bottom, top, except for very simple connect connectives. If you do this procedure of painting the, 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 the connective with a different color, adding the, the two sets of axioms, there is no collapse. So it's a very general uh, uh, result. Now let me sh show you how this looks in set set. Now I bring back my axioms and I want to show you how proofs look like. I'm going to formalize this later, but let's just look at a very simple thing like P implies P. How do I start? Well, nothing. There is nothing here, right? So I start from nothing. And then I can use, say, uh, this which tells me that I can put this on one side and this on the other side. So I have alternatives. And I'm going to explore the two alternatives. Now, the second alternative is already what I was looking for. I stop. The first alternative uh, allows me to use this with P. And then I have P implies P, which is this. So in both alternatives, I was able to get to this. So it's proved. Now let's take something a little bit different. Instead of putting just one formula here, I said that we could put a set of formulas. So let's look at a set of formulas. Well, it's very similar. Very similar again. So this passage is justified by this rule. This is one of the guys that I wanted. And this passage is justified by this, this rule. And this is the other one of the guys that I wanted. And that's a proof. So because I was looking for one among a set of alternatives, and in one case, one scenario, I found it, and on the other scenario, I found the other one, then I can say that I have proved one of this, okay, in either case. Now let's take something a little bit more difficult. Let's say that we have axiom three, which is not, perhaps not the way that you would expect one to say that the implication is classical, but it's one way of doing it. So I just put it here because it's, it's quite funny. It says in classical logic that P disjunction PQ implies Q disjunction P. Or <laughs> in, in intuitionistic logic, these two things are not equivalent. When you say they are, then you uh, the logic becomes classical. So how do you prove it? Well, again, you can start by, by using this. And then you have two scenarios. You have this, or you have the whole formula, because this is the first part. And then you have the implication, is this. And then you keep, keep doing that. Again, I have this, or this implies something. So this, or this implies something. Again, I can, I can put this, or this implies something. So I'm using this a lot of times. This is the classical way of looking at implication. So I have all these cases to consider. And then if you're, we are in this case, you can just use this rule. Uh, here we have already arrived at where we wanted. Here I can use again this rule. Uh, and now here I can use this rule again to get this whole thing. Sorry, this whole thing. And here is the, the only part that I use modus ponens because then I have uh, here Q uh, coming from, um, from uh, where? From here and here. By modus ponens, and then you have from these two guys by modus ponens this guy. Modus ponens is this rule, as you remember, and then from this guy again, I can always insert something in front of it by using this axiom. Okay, so this like has thirteen or fourteen notes, uh, and it's a bit more complicated. But there is something interesting about it. If you look at the whole proof, all the formulas you find in this proof are subformulas of the formulas that you had in A3. And this is the case for all the, the, the proofs that are presented here. There's nothing miraculous appearing here, nothing that needs to be cut, no use really of ingenuity, and this can be fully uh, uh, mechanized. Because in all these examples that I presented, and actually anything that I prove in this system, I have this generalization of the, uh, um, the subformula property that any formula that appears in the proof might be taken to be 
a subformula of the things that you are uh, that you want to derive that you have in your uh, in your uh, conjecture. Okay, so what's the difference here? I'm not going to be talking about uh, sequences of lines or even trees, even though Schuschmidt and Smiley, who present this procedure, they call this uh, uh, proof trees. I'm going to call this proof developments in the, in the same way that uh, William Neal used to talk about this, because there's something happening there. And uh, we're not going towards a single thing. We might be going towards anything or any of the alternatives. And you see that the bifurcation happens uh, up from the top to the bottom instead of from the bottom to the top. Now, I like to think of this instead of thinking that there is an onion being built and that you're adding things, that you are actually multiplying this onion and that you have several scenarios. So in one case, you go to one alternative and then you might go to another alternative. And you have now a task uh, to look at all these parallel efforts, all these different proofs. And in all of them, all of these uh, uh, proofs going in parallel, you have to be able to, to show that you get what you want. So it's, you're multiplying the, the effort. You can, this can also be put in terms of a set on the other side. But I think I like to still to think that there is one formula. And actually, what you have in every node as before is all the things that appeared in that branch. So at every node, you can use everything that appears on that branch. We write one formula as usual, but we mean that we can use everything that's on top of it. And a uh, nice thing about the set-set uh, approach, as most people already know, is that the, the, you have a categorical characterization of logic in general and connectives in general. So you, 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 can, uh, um, you can be sure that you're talking about that truth table and not another one which slightly differs from it but has the same consequence associated to it. Because there is a single consequence relation in set-set associated to each uh, um, description and each uh, truth table. Okay, so just, just to compare uh, proof formalisms, I want to say that in, uh, I'm going to call G calculate the Gensin style calculate. Uh, there you manipulate very complex things, like not just formulas, but also context, while in, in Hubert style calculate, even in the, in the sense that I presented here, an extended sense, uh, the rules are shaped by the consequence relations type, meaning that the things that you find there in the rules are precisely consecutions. Uh, the separation property is a property that whenever you, you, you can derive something then you can find the derivation of that something which uses only the connectives that are actually concerned. Well, we have a, a similar thing here. Of course, natural deduction is a little bit tricky to, to, to prove. You have to do some, some normalization uh, and get and calculate this much simpler in general. But and, and if you want to do uh, usual Hubert style systems, it's really hard to do. But in, as I've shown, shown in the set set approach, it's, it's easy. You have this, and you have actually a generalization of subformula property, as I mentioned, which is uh, one of the consequences that you have from that separation property. Now, uh, the task, I'm going to talk about more analyticity uh, later. It's easier to, and attainable to, to, to prove that uh, proof systems, Gensin style, are analytic. And in set set, you can also do that for uh, Hubert calculi. Um, there's a big problem here I probably won't have time to talk about, but it's hard to avoid sometimes just to get interactions between the connectives. You, you, you write rules for conjunction for this junction and suddenly they start interacting and suddenly things are distributive just because you added all this together. If you work on set formula, you can completely avoid this. It's not a problem at all. But if you uh, go to set set, you're just in the same situation that this is, is going to sprout from your calculi. So that would be an advantage for set formula if you think of it. Uh, and in terms of combination of different systems, saying that you want to put these systems to live together, there is a lot of ad hoc uh, uh, work when you're doing this in Gensin Calculate because you have to see if there is nothing, if the extension is conservative, you have to be really careful about it. And for the case of Hubert Calculate, it's that simple. You, you get the two systems, the two axiomatizations, put them together, that's it. That's the least calculate that extends the, the, the two calculate you had before. So it's, it's done. For co combining logics, it's the simplest, simplest thing in the world. Uh, semantics for Gensin calculi relatively easy uh, to produce. Uh, for uh, Hubert style systems in set formula, really not that obvious. Sometimes really hard. But as you have seen, there is a procedure for doing this in the case of a set set Hubert style systems. So it's simple again. Okay, so from now on, I want to describe more specific results, which are going to give a basis for my claims. So some of you might have seen some of this, or maybe uh, I'm generalizing things you have seen before. 
But let's uh, take a, a logical matrix here to be something a little bit different from you find in the literature. It will be uh, an algebra together with a set of designated truth values. But this algebra for me is going to be non-deterministic algebra, meaning that for every connective, when you give a tuple as an input, you can choose things you put on the output. It's not that you can choose every time a different thing, but it's uh, whenever you might have choices, like in the case of the tables that I sh I've shown before, or in the case of this example here, for instance, when you have uh, an conjunction n, you might have the choice of choosing either f or n. Now, uh, I, usual presentations of non-deterministic semantics uh, take this, but take out the empty set from here because they don't want uh, an output to be empty. I'm not going to do this because we know how to do it even with the, uh, in the partial approach. So in the, in the case in which some, some things just happened to, 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 to give you no possibility of output. And the usual definition of entailment associated to such a system is the one that you would expect in terms of compatibility. You're trying to avoid, in terms of the dark triangle that, you show, uh, that I've shown before, you're trying to avoid the possibility of producing a counter model. So putting all the formulas here in the class of designated or asserted sentences, if you want, and putting all the formulas here in the class of denied sentences. Now, here's an example of a logic that appeared uh, through purely uh, um, computer science uh, considerations uh, in 2007. It was called the logic of information sources. By combining information sources, it happened to be not fully deterministic. And if you look at, uh, at it this way, uh, taking this as a set of designated values, you have a uh, non-deterministic logic matrix. Now, I want to describe this or anything that looks like this. And the way I'm going to do this is the following. First of all, let's imagine that we have a unary formula which works as a separator. What is separating things? Well, I want to distinguish in between two values. Say that two values are designated. I want to say that which one is which. Maybe they're not the same and say that two values are undesignated, I want to separate these two values too. Now, uh, the negation of P happens to separate T and B in that system because the negation of T, as you have seen here, the negation of T, which is designated, is F, which is undesignated, and the negation of B, which is designated, is also designated, it's T itself. Now, I'm gonna say that uh, a, a collection D separate iso isolates a certain truth value when not only I can separate a single truth values but I can uh, I, 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 that collection contains enough separated for separators for distinguishing any pair of truth values and uh, if you consider just in this in the case of this system for instance you consider just two formulas then you show that they can be used for separating all the truth values from all the others and a, a discriminator here is, is, is defined in terms of this isolation. You want to isolate, you want to be sure that this isolates F from the rest. You want to be able to show that this isolates N from the rest. And as you see, all of them contain precisely P and not P. So this uh, uh, is enough to isolate everything you have. But what we're doing here is that we're saying that, look, if I want to separate N from uh, to, to say what, how n behaves, I just have to say that while well, n is undesignated and the negation of n is also undesignated. So this is a unique description of what the value n does. And I'm using negation to do that. Okay. Uh, it just happened to be negation. Could have been anything. It's just a unary connective. Now, um, right, so let me introduce this uh, proof theoretic uh, description first by Purely looking at the tables and writing what I did at the beginning, a description of how you can determinize that truth table. And the way that you do that is the following. As you remember, I want to take values out from the truth table. I want to delete the values. So the way that I do is by imposing rules that do that. And what I'm saying here is that this rule that I just pointed out here is the one that says that something about y, which is that this value does not belong to the possible outputs when these are the inputs. So for examples here, uh, you look at uh, T disjunction N. So T disjunction N. So you look here. So you see that here you don't have uh, F, you don't have B, you don't have N, 
So if you want to say that B is not there, then you have to write this. And by the description that I wrote before, this amounts to writing this rule. So these rules are automatically calculated, each one of them, uh, with the purpose of deleting values until you get to the table that you want. So it's a, it's a normal form description of the truth table. This is, by the way, one thing that uh, Carolina Blasi was working um, years ago. Um, and we presented this for the first time in 2013. So this is uh, now registered as a way of describing the truth tables. For the partial case, which we didn't do the partial case at the time, but uh, uh, we knew how to do it. But <laughs> here it is. Calero and Marcelino published in this issue that was published yesterday. They published this result. Uh, the result is that if you want to describe now not just a truth table or a collection of truth tables, but a logic which contains the algebra with the truth tables and the designated values, then you have to describe which are the values that you have. You have to describe which one of those are designated, which one are undesignated. You have to uh, specific rules to describe the situations in, in which you have an empty output. And you have to use all the consecutions that I described before, the ones that are illustrated at the beginning of this, of this talk, which describe the tables. Right? So besides the tables, you have to do some other work to describe the matrix containing those tables. For an example of how you do that, uh, this, this thing here says that you have to identify the sets of designated and undesignated sets. But, uh, when you write this, you see this says something about F plus and minus or of D. So it says something about F. So it says that F is not a designated value. So this comes from this collection of, of uh, rules. And uh, this thing here comes from these other collection of rules describing the partial components. And it says in particular that this is not a subset of the universe of a submatrix of uh, the original matrix. So actually, by the way, this would give us, uh, um, this would be sound for the partial matrix uh, for Tonk, which is a partial non-terministic uh, um, two-value connective in this approach. Okay, so what about proof theory? So let me go back to what we had before and explain Well, we had rules of inference in this form. And either you have an empty set and what's going to happen in the development is that you're going to put here a mark to say that that's it, quit. This branch is not going to be developed any further. Or you have uh, things growing, like at a certain moment you have a number of formulas in that node, everything that came before in the branch. And then suddenly you might have to choose in which direction you go. So you might either go here or go there or go there, which is what we were doing before. And these pictures here actually surface to describe finite proof developments. But this uh, approach can be, can be uh, extended to the non-finitary case for non-compact logics. And then you will have uh, possibly uh, infinite, possible infinite trees, possibly infinite trees. Now, what, uh, what does it mean to say that Psi is provable from Phi? It means that there is something like this, a proof development, which is rooted here. So this thing appears here on the root. And the leaves are all closed with respect to this set. And being closed mean, means either that you have quit going on or that you have in each leaf a set that intersects the Psi. As you have seen before, it's enough to find one thing over there because it's a set of alternatives. So you find one, you can dilute it later if you, to put all the others if you want. And this would be an axiomatization for classical logic, not just with the implication, but also with negation. And here you have a, an example in, of, in which you have an empty uh, output. It's the explosion principle. OK, I claim that uh, this is analytic, so I have to define what I mean by being analytic. Let's not look at this definition. Let's look at an example. Uh, I'm going to say that something is analytic with respect to two given formulas. When I use these formulas to produce the, 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 an extension of the subformula. So I use P to think that I want all the subformulas of the formula that I was interested on. And I use not P to say that I'm putting, I can put one negation in front of every subformula that I had before. Okay, so it's analytic with respect to that. Means that you, in this case, you don't have to add anything. In this case, you have to use the separator negation. For classical logic, you don't need that separator. You, it's classical logic is P analytic. Okay, but for as we want to do this for any many valid logic, we might need to put other things inside and generalize the notion of being a subformula off. And I'm going to say that the calculus itself is analytic with respect to theta. 
when it has a proof which contains only things from this set, which, as you have seen, the case of classical logic is just a set of subformulas. But in the case of the logic I just presented now, also contains other generalized subformulas. And an interesting thing is that the result that I proved before actually gives you not only a proof uh, uh, system, but the proof system is analytic with respect to that set, the set that contains all these things that you need for describing the generalized notion of subformula. So it's always an analytic uh, uh, proof system. Well, it so happens then because it's analytic, we can make it, uh, can make it, can automate it. And this is a, a, a description of the of the algorithm that has been implemented by by Vito, and uh, the algorithm gives you a decision procedure which, uh, in the worst case, uh, is exponential uh, on uh, on the number of of uh, on the number of formulas involved or subformulas, right? And it will be polynomial uh, um, polynomial time when uh, there is only one formula in every rule. It so happens that the logic of information sources that I presented is one example of such a, uh, such a case in which you can have all inference rules described with a single formula on this side. Now, if you want to make it fully deterministic, there is no way of, of, of you uh, uh, doing that without putting uh, more than one formula on the succeedant. But that logic wasn't fully deterministic. And it so happened by chance that it was described as fully describable in uh, set formula. So it happens to be uh, associated to a polynomial decision procedure. Uh, there's another complexity result, actually, that for the finite finitary anal analytic uh, systems, actually, the decision procedure belongs to Cohen P, which is pretty good, given all the things that <laughs> we know uh, for other systems. And uh, to wrap up this, I want now to do the real thing I, I propose, which is the thing in the, in the paper. So we go towards an approach in which, actually, there is a need to be bilateral. There is a need to consider two different kinds of, uh, of judgment. And how is this going, going to go? Well, I'm going to add another set here in the description of the logical matrices. So I not only I have the designated formulas, or I might call them accepted, uh, designated values, I might call them accepted values, the ones that I, when I attribute them to a formula, I say that I'm willing to accept the information contained therein. And this one is going to be totally separate, totally independent set of rejected or anti-designated. Some of you have already seen systems containing designated and undesignated uh, sets. In a paper by uh, Carolina Blas, Johannes Schwanzing, and myself, we have um, shown that um, uh, there is a very simple abstract uh, approach to the matter, and that allows us to uh, extend Sushko's result to, to say that every logic uh, in this approach will be actually uh, four valid rather than two valid, and the approach is this one. So I have a new notion of consequence. The notion of semantical consequence here has two things on the left and two things on the right. So the idea here is that uh, things I put here, the things are willing to, well, let's think of the negative version of this, the compatibility version of this. It's saying that whenever you assert all this and you don't reject any of this, and you don't accept any of this, and you reject all this, then you have a counter model. So this is saying that you don't want this to happen, right? It's very similar to what we had before, only that acceptance and non-rejection are not the same thing, not necessarily the same thing. And rejection and non-acceptance are not necessarily the same thing. Now, this is an interesting example in which you just make a combination of K3 and LP. What's the combination? Well, just imagine that you delete all the Bs here. What you have is the, the matrix for uh, conjunction in K3. And now you imagine that you delete all the ends from here. What you get is the matrix for conjunction in uh, LP. Now, if you do this combination, if you take these two logics together and you look at the consequence associated to the collection with the two logical matrices, then you get this. You, can, you get a logic that can be characterized using this uh, collection of truth tables. And what we're doing here is not just taking the logical matrix, but the extended notion of logical matrix by taking this to be accepted and this to be rejected values. I'm going to show that it does make a difference to do that. As you see, this is just a generalization of what we had before, but that's a very interesting thing happening here. Uh, the notion of sufficient expressiveness that we had before is now made more expressive. Now you can do more things than you had before. To do this before, you would have to use negation. And now I don't have to use negation. I can just use a single formula. You see, it's just P that appears everywhere here. 
and I can do all the distinct distinctions that I want to do because I can now refer to acceptance and refer to rejection separately. Or if you prefer assertion and denial separately. Now, to see the rules, how they look like, this is very similar also. Let's look here. It's easier to see than the, 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 the big thing over there. What's happening here is something that you might describe like this. This is something that's happening with respect to the positive consequence, and this is the negative consequence, all together, in parallel. So you do the two things at once, because you, you are allowed to do these two things at once in a single consequence relation or in a single proof. You don't need to separate in between two proofs and do two things at the same time. It's just on the same place. And you have to do the same things as before. If you want to determine the truth table, you have to say, well, I don't want T to be among the outputs when this is, these are the inputs, when F and F are the inputs. Then you have to write this complicated thing, which actually results in a very simple rule. And these rules often can be simplified, streamlined, as I have shown in the beginning of this talk. Now, you can prove this result, which is generalized the result by, by Calero and Marcelino, which is the one that was in our paper presented in Tableau this year. Uh, and the, re the result basically says that you can characterize using those kind of descriptions, two-dimensional proof-theoretic descriptions. Uh, actually, they're not proof-theoretic yet. I'm going to make them next. The, these descriptions, two-dimensional descriptions of any uh, uh, truth table. So it can be four-valued or more because you can use these separators, right? Uh, and uh, you have to add these three things, like just like before. You have to describe which things are truth values, which things are designated, undesignated, and so on. Now, how do the rules uh, look like? Now, you can uh, look here. You want to say that uh, you have T among the accepted values. So what you do is that you have to say this thing about T. You have to say all this at once. You have to say that you can do a plus thing here and a minus thing here at once. So it's a single rule that, that tells you this. And this rule is, is uh, as, or these rules are sound for the system that I presented before. It's a system in which uh, T is among the accepted values and N is among the non-rejected values. Okay. Now, another thing you can do is uh, here, you have to describe partial components. As you, as you have seen, we had partial components in this example. Here, here, we had here and here, empty, here and here, empty. And you have to describe what's going on for them to be empty. And you can do that using this kind of uh, rules over here. So to say that you don't have any sub-matrix of that matrix that I had before, which is total, if you start with Bn, then you have to write something like this. But you do have, as I have pointed out, if you start with Tnf or if you start with Tbf. These are total subcomponents of the matrix that, I, that I've shown before, but not this one. Okay, so you have to write rules that uh, express this. That's the trick. On the, uh, for the proof for the partial case. Now, as you see, there, we must generalize the notion of proof also, and it's very simple. It's just like the same pictures we had before, but there will be a blue side and a red side. On the blue side, we're doing things positive, like with respect to acceptance, and on the red side, we're doing things with respect to rejection. And then uh, when we do a development of the proof, what we do is that we have a number of alternatives here, and we have to consider all of them. These are the blue alternatives. These are the red alternatives. So you have to consider all the alternatives that might sprout from the application of this rule, that might develop from the application of that rule. And the notion of proof at the end says that you prove something when you have uh, either, either a formula that you're looking for uh, here, either a formula from here or a formula from here is at the end of every leaf of your proof. Right? Before you had to find one on a set, now you have two sets, and you have just to find one in either of those sets to say that you have proved uh, this. So you see there's something upside down here, because actually we're going from here to here when we do, um, when we do this, and then we're going from here to here when we do this. It's a little uh, change in notation, because it becomes easier to see what's going on in the proof. And this is a full axiomatization for the, uh, this fragment of the logic that I presented before. So as you see, there are things happening on the left, there are things happening on the right, and there are things that happen also, uh, in fact, with respect to the two sides. These are the interplay rules, right? It involves the two sides. Now, we have a generalization of the procedure, of course, and we have the, the same results. 
uh, as we had before, we have a decision procedure that runs at most in exponential time. And if all the inferences rules, inference rules contain one formula on the right hand side or inverted because now it's symmetric, if it contains only one formula on the left hand side, then there will be a polynomial time procedure associated to it. So the symmetric environment also allows us to think not only in terms of a preservation of assertion, but also preservation of denial. Both can be made polynomial in this case, in the same uh, approach, fully uh, symmetric uh, uh, approach. Now, this is a bonus. It's the last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show. I said that th this could actually give you uh, new things. We already knew that when we uh, describe uh, logics by uh, acceptance and rejection or assertion and denial at the same time, we can get new things. And one of the things is that uh, we knew theoretically that we could uh, describe even theories which were uh, did not have a finitely based description by um, finite basis if you went to theories that had two sides, that had axioms and anti-axioms. That we already knew. And now here is an example of how actually we can uh, re-axiomatize a logic that was in the literature and that was presented for the first time using an infinite number of axioms and nobody knew how to make it finite. It's not a problem because we had a five-valued semantics for this logic. So great, even though it doesn't have a finite presentation, it does have a very finite non-deterministic semantics associated to it. Uh, but it so happens that that semantics is not sufficiently expressive in the sense that I presented before. So it cannot, it does not allow us to extract a finite axiomatization directly from it using the procedure we had before. Now, it's very simple to fix it. You just take this matrix, put it here, add a set of or, or anti-designated values, the rejected values, and now it happens that it is sufficiently expressive. And in fact, you can use just again, P and not P to explain what's happening in every one of these cases. Just P is the case, P and not P, P and not P, or P. So P and not P is always enough. Negation is not essential here. One unary connective is necessary here. In the four valued case, for us to show that there is a way of determinizing this truth table using a finite number of clauses, and this, is hap this happens to be a finite axiomatization for the logic. So we didn't have that before, and now we have it, and it's automatic, actually. You just have to consider the logic to have a second set of designated values. And if you don't care about what's happening in the four positions here, if you don't care about the two-dimensional thing going on here, you can just focus on here, because the logic lives on this aspect of the consequence that we had before. It lives on one diagonal. What happens on the others? Well, very interesting things, but you might not be interested. You might be interested only in looking at the T aspect of the logic, only the plus aspect of the logic, and the logic MCI lives there. Of course, this system contains more than that. As I say, you have also an F aspect of the logic living here. You have the other things which are not Tarskin living here and here, or even here and here. You have many things combined in a single structure. Fine, I'm just conclude now by saying that we can revisit the earlier claims. Uh, according to the first one, before I said we could describe any truth table, and now it's, I'm being much more precise in that we actually can describe any logical matrix. Matrices contain more than just truth tables. Um, again, uh, consecutions were enough to axiomatize everything here, so we didn't need force indicators, and then force indicators are not essential in any way to, uh, to say that this is a bilateralist approach. Um, we have uh, set set Hilbert style proof systems available. I say many cases because I've shown this for the finite valued case. But as I said, the procedure applies to any infinite uh, matrix, if, uh, both uh, with one single set or two sets of designated values. And uh, Vito is working now on generalizing this to any any collection of uh, of designated sets, any family of designated sets. The systems that we extract and that we describe are actually analytic, generalizing this, this uh, subformula properly. And there is a validity decision procedure, which is uh, fully understood. Um, it's, it's a general procedure. Of course, in particular cases, we can make it more efficient by using heuristics that apply to particular logics. But that was a general procedure for any logic that comes from that procedure, from that uh, extraction procedure. 
Now, uh, I also claim that we could do more and that we could actually have these bilateral judgments living in orthogonal directions. We could talk about one notion of consequence and another one, both in the same environment, the environment of a two-dimensional notion of consequence. So it's a different approach to what it means to be able to express bilateral judgments. And as I have seen, these uh, axiomatizations that we extract in that case can uh, be really nice. For instance, by giving uh, us making something infinite finite, which is uh, well worth uh, the effort. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm uh, ready to answer questions.